Uh, hi everyone, my name is Julianne Pierce. I'm the executive producer of Blast Theory. Uh, it's fantastic to be here in Belgrade and thanks for staying to the end. I know it's been a long day and I really appreciate you, um, you know, staying for these final presentations. So I have about half an hour and I'm going to, I guess, give you an introduction to the work of Blast Theory uh, leading up to some of our most recent projects. Uh, I, I'm not one of the original members of the company, uh, but it, it's um, the company formed in London in 1991 uh, with backgrounds in performance and visual arts. And the, the company to start with was primarily a performance company who I, I guess sort of came together with a real in interest in how to take performance out of the theatre space and how to really look at using other forms of uh, spaces like nightclubs, warehouses, um, in public space to create performances, which I guess in 19... I mean, that's something we take for granted now, but 20 years ago, it was, it was still a sort of quite a new idea in terms of thinking about theatre. Um, so, uh, the company is really known, I guess, for its work with technology, and especially over the last 10, 15 years, its work with mixed reality, gaming technologies, augmented reality. Uh, but that really came about through a uh, collaboration with the Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham. And that collaboration that started in the, in the late 1990s really started to influence and impact on the work of Blast Theory. And the company really started to integrate emerging technologies into their, into their performance language. But the company has never used technology for the sake of using technology, because the Blast Theory is really interested in how to engage with an audience, how to immerse, to give an audience an immersive experience, to let them really participate and interact and create the experience for themselves using technology. So for us, it, even though technology is really fundamental to how we make our work, it's not the driving force. The driving force is how we engage with an audience, what are the political implications of technology, what are the social and cultural implications of, te of technology, and especially as technology has emerged um, into, I, I guess, much more pervasive technology, which we carry around with us all the, all the time, you know, um, our iPhones and our pockets, um, uh, you know, our iPads, and how this is affecting our relationships with each other, how it affects our own engagement with technology, and how, in fact, technology has come to, to dominate our life. So we're really interested in the company in exploring those sorts of social aspects of technology. But I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're trying to achieve as a company. We have a space in Brighton. Um, so the company is, is still based in the UK. As you can probably tell, I'm Australian, and I've worked with the company for about four years, but I've worked with them for a long time. I've brought their work to Australia, and we've sort of made artistic collaborations together over the years. So when the company took on this space, uh, I came to work with them to really look at how, as an artistic company, we could sort of create a really interesting environment that started to talk about not only the work of Blast Theory, but the sort of the, the areas of interest that we're interested in and, um, and how we can start to develop a community of interest and practice around, I guess, investigations into pervasive media, location-based media, mixed reality, augmented reality. Um, and I'm sure... I'm not going to go into explanations of those terms and, you know, I, I assume that most of you are, are quite familiar with, with those terms now. So we have a space... Uh, which is a renovated warehouse in an old um, timber yard on the port in, in Brighton. And basically, um, we're sort of creating that as a really social space where we bring people together for workshops and seminars. And we've, we've also started a residency program. So 
we're really wanting to bring other practitioners into the building to, I guess, engage with them and to see how other people are working and how that might influence our practice, but also what sort of collaborations and partnerships might come out of just putting together, putting people together in this space. So it's a really, I guess, innovative model in terms of how, as artists, we're trying to create a community of, of interest and practice around um, what we specialise in. Um, and we have a lovely terrace, which is sort of perfect now in, in, um, in, this, you know, in the summer months, and we, we throw parties up there and invite people to come around, and, you know, it's a really nice sort of social space. Um, so we, as I mentioned, we run a residency program. Uh, we have a small bed sit where people can come and stay. We, have a, we give a studio to our residents. So they, I just thought I'd let you know this is the sort of outline of our residency program and these are the sort of practitioners that we aim it for. And, uh, you know, I'd be really happy to talk to anyone here who, who might be interested in, in coming and having a residency with us. And uh, we offer... Uh, artist talks for our residents. This is one of our recent residents, Andy Field. Um, and residents can... I mean, basically, residents can come and do whatever they like in the space. Um, a lot of people come and just try out some new ideas. Uh, this was uh, a new work that Andy Field was working on. And I'm also really proud to say that um, our favourite residents so far are actually based here in Belgrade. Um, Bogdan Spanjevic and Mirko uh, Stojevic came and had a residency with us in 2010. Are you here, Bogdan? So there's Bogdan, our favourite resident. Um, not only because their work is fantastic, they bought us about six bottles of rakia, which we, um, which we uh, indulged in most, <laughs> most nights. And, um, and I think you're taking me to drink rakia later tonight. So one of, one of the outcomes of, of Bogdan and Mirko's residency was that th th they've been developing a, a game that some of you might, might know. I think it, they've, you've shown it here in Belgrade. I think uh, perhaps a work in progress. But they premiered this new work, Sir By Am, which is a, a location-based sort of per pervasive media game based on the history of, of Serbia at Hide and Seek in London last year. So that was a really out, fantastic outcome for us, that um, these two artists that I guess they really inspired us and we hope we inspired them, ha have gone on to sort of create really strong networks in the UK and internationally and have been back to, to the UK to show work. So to Blast Theory and to our work, I guess the, the first work that Blast Theory became really known for, and I guess launched the company into the international spotlight, was a work called Kidnap. And the company were commissioned to make a, a small film for, for a cinema. And what they decided to do was to create an advert to kidnap people. So uh, you could call in a number and you could register to go on this kidnap register. And, that, and then a shortlist of 10 people um, were notified that they're on a shortlist and that they could be kidnapped at any time. And this... Uh, so two people were, were kidnapped. Um, they were aware that they might be kidnapped, but they, they weren't sure. So they were kidnapped and bundled into this van and then taken to a, to a safe house, to a, secret, to a secret location where... They were put under surveillance for three days. They didn't know where they were. Um, obviously, we had a duty of care towards them, but you know, we limited their access to food and water, and I guess really tried to create this experience of kidnap, um, of, of kidnapping. And it was it was also streamed live on the internet, which in 1998 was still sort of quite early days of, of live streaming, but. This was, I guess, one of the first opportunities that I had to engage with the work of Blast Theory. And the, so there was a 24-hour surveillance stream into the safe house where you could watch the, watch the, the um, people that were, that were kidnapped. And it was sort of pretty boring, really, but it was just interesting, um, I guess, the way that Blast Theory was starting to use technology at that point. 
Then in 1999, Desert Rain was the first major work made with the Mixed Reality Lab. Um, and that time in the late 90s was the first Gulf War Desert Storm, which I'm sure many of you would remember, a very, a very provocative and divisive um, engagement in the Middle East, which st has still, still has ongoing ramifications today. But the company were really interested, I guess, in um, that marriage of video game, video game graphics and, and war itself and, and engagement. So they created an interactive installation where six people had to go on a mission into a terrain and work with each other to, um, to find certain sort of people and objects within that terrain. Uh, I mean, the graphics are still... I mean, if you look at them now, they're, they're very basic graphics, but the idea of the work was to really create an immersive gameplay experience. So the audience sort of ha had a large screen in front of them. It was actually a water screen, and the images were projected on the water, water screen, and they had to navigate via a, a, a floor pad, which was a bit like a, a very early Wii pad. So they had to navigate through this space, work together to, to find the way out. And it was a really, really... It was a very successful work. It toured for the company. Um, it toured internationally. And I guess really put the company on the map as, as a group of artists who were exploring technology in really interesting ways, but also exploring technology with a political implication, with a, with a sort of with a will to actually engage with the politics of technology, the politics of the military, the politics of the media, and, and to put all of that together in quite a sort of fun, engaging experience. So uh, that was a real milestone for the company, and we've sort of continued to, to, to work in this, I guess, form of interactive storytelling. But... We've become much more interested re recently in mobile technologies and how you can start to engage with an audience using mobile phones and using really basic um, technologies like SMS and text messaging and how you can actually create a dialogue with an audience, a sort of disembodied audience remotely via, via text messaging. So, Day of the Frigorines um, is an SMS game played over 24 days. Uh, it's set in a fictional town, which is basically a board game. It's a, it's a gallery installation, so the audience come into the gallery, they see this board that's set up in the gallery, and each, each sort of aspect of this board represents a, an area in this city, in this fictional city. So you go in and you choose a figurine and you, and you give it a name. And then over the next 24 days, your figurine has to make its way around this fictional city. And you're given a series of tasks. Um, you have to eat, you have to find objects, you have to engage with other players. But basically, you have to sort of we sort of ask the audience to, I guess, have a parallel sort of story, a parallel life running, you know, running alongside their everyday life. So, so every day you, you receive a series of text messages and engage with, this, engage with this game. And as you move around the board, every hour uh, there's a projection that comes down and shows where each player has moved in the city. So each one of these lines is where a player has moved around um, every hour in, in the city. Uh, so more recently, we've, uh, we're really continuing on, on using mobile technology and mobile phones, and, but we're becoming a lot more interested in automated voice calling and creating performance experiences that I guess is somewhat cinematic, where we ask the audience to take a walk around a city where they receive a series of phone calls and they make phone calls and make recordings. And 
we sort of plunge the audience for a half an hour, 45 minutes, in, into a story where they have to make decisions, where they have to um, uh, find their way through the city, navigate their way through the city. They might have to interact with other people along the way. But we're really interested in, I guess, how mobile phones are so ubiquitous and that we see people all the time and we do it, you know, we all do it, we walk along talking on our mobile phones, but we're really interested in, in playing with that and turning that sort of everyday act of walking around a city into a story, into some sort of interactive experience that engages you again in some sort of parallel experience. Um, so this work that we created in 2009 is called Ulrika and Eamon Compliant. It's based on two actual figures, very controversial figures who, who, you, who you might know. Ulrika Meinhof, who was a member of the Red Army faction um, uh, in, in Germany during the 1970s, and Eamon Collins, who was a member of the Irish Republican Army but turned super grass and was murdered. And his murder has never been solved, um, but it's suspected that it was the IRA who murdered one of their own. And by basing this work on these two fictional characters, well, they're not, on these two characters um, who had very radical lives, they became politicised, they murdered, uh, and they became extreme in, in their actions. And we're really interested in what, I guess, at what point in your life would you become radical? At what point in your life would you choose to, to murder someone, to kill someone for what you believed in? So in this work, you, you start in a room, you pick up a phone, and you're asked to select to be one character, or Rika Meinhof or Eamon Collins. And then you're given instructions to walk around the city. And actually, as you come in, you see this someone being interviewed on this, on this monitor. And in, at this stage, you're not really making a connection to what you're, you're watching on the screen. You're just really focusing on choosing this character and, and going on this walk. Um, so this work is also about sort of documentary. We're really interested in, in I guess, how technology, how sort of interactive technologies and immersive technologies can use documentary and, I guess, create a twist on documentary and actual events. So the, the audience go off into the street. This is Venice, obviously. It was um, a very lovely setting for the work. And over about half an hour, they have to... They're given uh, information about the life of Ulrika Meinhofer and Eamon Collins, and they are asked to start to think about what they might change in their life. Is there anything that you would want to change in your life? Um, is there anything you can do for the people around you? Do you want to, you know, do you feel compelled to somehow act? Or are you happy to be passive? And I guess we start to really play with this idea of sort of passivity and action. At what point would you choose in your life to take action? Uh, so there's a lot of people standing around on bridges just listening to phone calls. So it's, um, it is very sort of embedded in the city. It's very hidden. But the text itself is, is very sort of inflammatory in some ways and, and, uh, and, I, and I guess provocative. So at the end of the walk, you're guided into an identical room that, uh, that you started the walk in. It's not the same room, but it's, it, it, it's an identical room in another space. And in this room, um, in this, in this room you're interviewed. And, um, and in this interview, you're asked, uh, you know, what would you fight for? What do you believe in? Who would you kill for? And I ask you to reflect upon this experience you've had. And then, um, oops. And then... And then as you come out of the room, uh, you realise that it's a two-way mirror and that someone's been watching you. So it, it sort of plays on, it plays on surveillance and it plays on observation and it plays on, you know, 
to what extent you've taken on, on, the, on this character and to what extent in half an hour can you challenge your beliefs. So, you know, we hope that people walk away from this work sort of really thinking about, you know, what they would kill for or what they would die for. Um, so just to finish off, I'm going to talk about our latest work, A Machine to See With, which is a commission from three partners in North America, Zero One San Jose, which is a, a festival in San Jose, Sundance Film Festival and Banff New Media Institute. Uh, so we, uh, it, was a competitor, it was a competition, we applied for it and we were selected as the, as the, um, uh, as the successful candidate. And the commission itself was to think about this idea of locative cinema, to think about what cinema could be in, you know, in this age of, I guess, pervasive technology and social media. How is an audience, how is our relationship to cinema changing via technology when, you know, when cinema can be with us all the time and we can choose to sort of watch cinema at, at, at any time of day or night? We don't have to go into a cinema anymore. But it also really asked, I guess, what is cinema outside of the cinema space? Can we still have a cinematic experience that is not within the cinema space? So it was, it was a really fantastic challenge. And we created a work called A Machine to See With, which is actually a quote from a Jean-Luc Godard film. And the work is very influenced by Godard, by Godard's, I guess, political, and, and Marxist approach to cinema. And it's also influenced by, um, by the current financial crisis. And in this, in this work, six people have to uh, sort of work together to plan a bank robbery. So once again, we're using automated voice calls. You're given an instruction to go to a street corner, and then you have to work with the five other people to plan a bank robbery. Uh, so you, once again, you receive and make phone calls. You're guided through the city, but you're also, you know, being asked, you know, would you rob a bank? Um, uh, you know, what, what, what's your response to the financial crisis? If you hadn't, if you didn't have any money, if you were desperate, you know, could you possibly rob a bank? Um, so it's been a really fantastic work for us, and I think. It's really fantastic to sort of go into cinema and go into this, uh, thinking about the relationship between cinema and technology and how cinema can be, I mean, cinema is with us all the time. We're so infused by the cinematic imagination. We all have, I guess, cinema playing in our heads all the time. So we're really interested in, in exploring those ideas. So, uh, but I am just going to show you a little bit of video. I think I've got a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to finish off with a video. And I don't know if there... Is there time for questions, or...? Can I take questions or not? No. No questions. So... Um, but I will just show you a little bit of video. If it works. Oh, there's no audio plugged in.